Hello everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards, and in this lesson number 199, uh, we'll continue with event-driven architecture by discussing something called anemic events. You can get a listing of all the lessons I do in Software Architecture Monday through my website at developer2architect.com slash lessons. If you're not familiar with event-driven architecture, I would encourage you to stop this video and take a look at lesson 165 where I talk about event-driven architecture, how it works, what it's good at, and what it's bad at, and then resume this particular video. Now this lesson is all about the payload of an event. So let's say that we have a customer who wants to place an order. Uh, this order or request goes into the order placement service and it in turn generates an order placed event. The question I'm going to talk about in this lesson is what should go in to this event payload? We have two basic answers to this question, two basic patterns. Uh, the first one is a full data payload pattern uh, where we place all of the information about that order into the event payload. On the other extreme, we have a pattern called the key-based contract where I only pass the key of that order. Which one should I use? Well, of course, the answer is it depends. And it depends based on the various trade-offs of each of these. So let's take some time to look at the trade-offs associated with each of these and then discuss this topic of anemic events and how it relates to these two options. Well, a full data contract means that once I place an order, order placement inserts the information and sends all of the data for that order, let's say it's 45 attributes and 500 KB of data in that triggered event. Payment and both payment and inventory respond to that event to be able to apply the payment and adjust inventory. Well, if we analyze the trade-offs of the full data contract, we see the first and biggest advantage of this is scalability and performance. It's faster because I don't have to reach out and query the database every time I respond to an event. And that produces much more scalable and elastic systems because the database typically is the bottleneck in most scalable systems. So because I'm not accessing the database, I get much better scalability. That's a huge advantage of the full data contract. But there's also disadvantages as well. So the trade-offs, the first one we see is that we will have multiple systems of record. All 45 attributes representing that order are not only in the database, but also floating around everywhere inside our event-driven architecture. And the minute I do an immediate update, now I have multiple systems of record. And it's really hard to control uh, the processing flow and order of events in an event-driven architecture. Uh, the second problem or trade-off that we have is that of contract management and versioning. So we have to decide what kind of contract are we going to have? Uh, is it going to be loose or strict? Uh, are we going to be using JSON schema, XML schema, maybe a language object? or is it just going to be a loose collection of JSON name value pairs? If it is strict, how am I going to version it? Uh, how am I going to communicate a version change to all these decoupled, highly, highly independent services and corresponding teams? And if I deprecate a version, how am I going to manage that as well? This can get fairly complex. Also, I have to deal with stamp coupling and bandwidth issues. Now, if you're not familiar with stamp coupling and bandwidth problems, uh, take a look at Lesson 105 from Software Architecture Monday, where I do talk about stamp coupling and what it means and the fairly serious problems that could occur uh, with using full data contracts. Well, let's take a look now at key-based contracts. With a key-based contract, order placement inserts all 45 attributes into the database. But when it triggers that event, it only sends the key. 
For example, order ID 123. Both payment and inventory respond to that event, but then have to query the database to get the necessary information it needs. Well, if we look at the trade-offs associated with key-based contract, we see the first big problem is that of scalability and performance. This system will necessarily be slower because we are querying the database every time we respond to an event because we don't have the corresponding data. Also, this might impact scalability and also elasticity because I'm hitting the database constantly with all the events that are being triggered and responded to. However, while that's a pretty serious negative <laughs> of key-based, uh, there's also some benefits because now I have a single system of record and that's going to give me much better data consistency and data integrity in my system because it's the only place the data resides in my entire event-driven architecture. Also, I don't have to worry about stamp coupling, bandwidth issues because it's such a small event, and I don't have to worry about contract management issues and versioning either because of the simplicity of this contract. Well, if we look at these two extremes here, a key-based contract or a full data contract, uh, we see a summary of kind of the trade-offs associated with this. Uh, with the key-based contract, uh, we get really good contract management and, and data consistency just because of the simplicity of that key or that contract. However, with the full data contract, we don't realize these, but we do realize much better scalability and performance. Well, that said, this lies within a spectrum of where we should probably be in terms of that data payload. And that's really what I want to discuss in this lesson. And that brings us to the topic of anemic events. And I will give you a demonstration of what this means. So let's say we have a user that wants to update their profile. Now, did you notice that in the prior example, we were doing a create? Uh, uh, we were creating a new order, uh, which was in effect an insert to the database. So passing the key allows me to retrieve all the information about that order. But in this scenario, I make updates to a profile which goes into the customer profile table. Now, the architect in this case does trigger an event, uh, a profile updated event, but decided to use the key-based contract uh, for reasons of simplicity, better contract management, uh, better data consistency, and we really don't require that much scalability and performance in this particular system. So a key-based contract was probably a good approach. However, we have three services that are interested and respond to updates that occur to the profile. Well, the first service gets this key-based contract, but says I can query the database, and obviously I will, but I'm not sure what data was updated. Uh, the second service responds to this event and says, well, wait a minute, I only have the key I can query, but I have various conditions and I'm not sure if I even need to respond or not based on the type of data that changes. And the third service queries and says, well, I can query this, but I don't know what the prior data was for this particular update. So the architect says, well, key-based contracts don't work well. This is a great example of an anemic event. An anemic event, as illustrated here on the screen, is an event that does not have enough information in the payload to be able to process that event. Now, certainly I can go and query the data, but I can't really answer these questions. And as a matter of fact, if we used a full data payload, this is still considered an anemic event. So isn't that interesting? Because this still doesn't have enough information to answer any three of these questions. And both of these are great examples of an anemic event. So we have our two options, key-based and full data, but neither of them solve this particular problem.
So we have a different kind of event. And to address these anemic events, we actually send in that profile updated event the data that's necessary for other services to be able to make decisions on what they should process. Uh, for example, I'm going to send in the customer ID, the old value, let's say the address changed from X to Y, the phone number changed from X to Y, uh, the mail code changed from X to Y, and I show both the new and old values in that event payload. Service 1 immediately knows now what data was updated because the only information in there were those updates. Uh, the second service now can query whether it needs to respond or not based on not only the data that changed, but the values that changed as well. And the third service now knows what the prior data was and can now do its corresponding processing. And as you can see, we have these two kinds of payloads, key-based and full data, and continually argue back and forth on these, where in fact that argument really should be about what kind of information do other event processors or services need to perform their kind of work, avoiding these things called anemic events, which are events that don't have enough information regardless if it's a full payload or not, to be able to process that event. And so this has been Lesson 199, Event Driven Architecture, talking about anemic events. Thank you so much for listening, and stay tuned in two more Mondays for the next lesson in Software Architecture Monday.